abortion, reproductive rights, and IVF. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor. There has been hot press news about Roe v. Wade likely getting overturned very soon after the Supreme Court had an opinion that was a draft leak. Number one, abortion is still legal. It is federally protected. But number two, this draft is likely going to become finalized in some version that will overturn Roe v. Wade. Now, something interesting for you to understand is that Roe v. Wade has been in place for almost 50 years. This is important because my field, I do IVF. IVF didn't even exist 50 years ago. The oldest IVF baby is in her early 40s. And the reason why this is so important for you is that IVF was able to come to exist and this technology could exist under the protection of Roe. So if we separate abortion. Let's take out your personal stance on abortion or if you would or wouldn't get an abortion or how you feel about other people getting abortions. Put it aside. What Roe v. Wade did is it made a person in charge of their own reproductive future. The reason why this is so important is essentially it took away rights from embryos, but essentially it said mother's right a mother's life is essential for embryo existence. This allowed IVF to exist. So to clearly state what IVF is, let's remember that IVF is when you grow a group of eggs that come out of the vault of the ovary every month, you take some hormone shots to get them to grow, and then you fertilize eggs with sperm in the lab. From there, embryos are grown out, they can be transferred immediately into the uterus, excess embryos can be frozen, and they can sometimes be biopsied from the placental segment to check for genetic diseases things that can be lethal, severely disabling, they can be passed down cancer diseases or really terrible things, or even for aneuploidy, a top cause of miscarriage and loss as we get older. IVF can be used for fertility preservation prior to doing cancer treatments. IVF can be used to prevent you from passing on lethal genes or having a child that you know is going to die. IVF can be used to plan for your future if you're not in a place to able to have a family but you know that you want one. IVF can be used to help have the family size you want, even if you found your life partner a little later or are pursuing IVF on your own. IVF allows people who have gone through terrible circumstances, had their uterus removed, they're able to go through IVF and have somebody else carry their baby. Somebody who's gone into ovarian failure early or had ovarian cancer, she can use donor egg IVF and carry a baby and have a baby. So IVF helps us bring life. So I don't care if you label yourself as pro-life or pro-choice. Overall, my job is to help families have life, have the family they want, whatever your family looks like. Now, the reason why reproductive rights and IVF fertility treatments get really wrapped up in abortion terminology is because a lot of times in these bills, they define when life begins. So if Roe v. Wade gets overturned, what will happen is the right to an abortion will go down to the state level. So states will pass their own varying laws. And currently 13 already have laws that would make abortion illegal altogether. Where we get highly concerned is the language used. So again, this is when politicians are making laws that impact someone's medical care. If you say that life begins at fertilization, the interesting thing is in the body, egg and sperm meet in the fallopian tube. That's where fertilization happens. That embryo is not at all connected to the body. Some of them will pass through and never implant. You'd never get a positive pregnancy test. That embryo had no connection to maternal circulation. Sometimes they do start to implant and the body realizes something's wrong and you have a miscarriage. Sometimes they implant in the wrong spot, like the fallopian tube. You cannot change the spot of where a pregnancy implants. However, normally it takes that embryo five to six days to growing till it gets to a blastocyst stage before it enters into the uterine cavity. Then it can implant and become attached to maternal circulation. And that is when you would detect a pregnancy. Now, if you define life beginning at fertilization, you're probably going to have a very hard time arguing that you can fertilize eggs, that you can grow embryos in a lab if those are independent life beings, that you can do genetic testing on them, that you can discard them. What does that mean for patients who've gone through IVF or who need IVF? 
Will some of these laws and states ban IVF in certain forms? They very well may, and this is a huge concern. Another important thing to realize is that technology has changed tremendously. We are able to make IVF safer. We're able to have less risks and more accessible. If you start putting in extra rules and restrictions, what will happen is IVF will become limited in accessibility. It will cost more and take longer to get to the outcome you want. And for certain people, they will be less likely to have success. One question that I am commonly asked is, can you limit the number of eggs fertilized? The answer here is yes, and I have patients that I've done this for. If you need IVF for X, Y, or Z reason, but you have an ethical difficulty with creating embryos that aren't going to be used, we will talk through where is your line in the sand and what do you feel comfortable with. For some patients, it's any embryo that's created has to get a chance at coming to life. We have to transfer it into me. Sometimes it's any normal embryo, any embryo that's genetically normal and has potential. So we have people who are okay with genetic testing, but any other normal embryos they want to transfer. We have people who are okay with freezing embryos, but they want to give each of them an independent chance at some point. And we have people who do not feel comfortable freezing embryos or testing embryos. And that's fine too. Nobody's going to force you to do that. If I have somebody who doesn't even feel comfortable freezing an embryo, then we talk through, we will only fertilize a set number of eggs at a time, depends on your age and your circumstance, and any embryo that grows out, we can do a fresh transfer on. Importantly, not every egg fertilizes and not every fertilized egg makes it to an embryo. Not every embryo is genetically normal, that's tied to age, and not every genetically normal embryo implants into the body. So what this means for us is that if you get two eggs, the odds of getting a pregnancy from only fertilizing two is low. It's not impossible, but it's low. Typically, about only 30% of your eggs will make it into an embryo state, and then the percentage normal is going to depend on your age. It'll be around 50% at age 35, 36, dropping to 25 to 30% at age 40. The chance of a live birth from transferring a genetically normal embryo is going to be around 65%. So this is not a guaranteed process at all. So if I am putting fewer eggs into this math equation, I'm increasing the odds I'm not gonna get a baby. Now I can go through it over and over again. I can go through the process over and over. I can spend more money, I can take more time. And patients who say this is the only way I feel comfortable with IVF, that's what we do and we don't think twice. That's what makes it comfortable for them and then that's the right choice. But to have the government mandate that that's what we have to do is going to make IVF less safe. Back before we could freeze embryos well and back before we did genetic testing, we transferred more embryos. We had high order multiple pregnancies because we needed to give them a chance. We had ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. We had patients going through IVF who were sick and in the hospital. IVF will be more dangerous, it'll cost more money, and fewer people will result in a pregnancy if some of these restrictions prohibit us from freezing embryos or testing embryos or discarding embryos. And what does this mean for you if you already have embryos? Ultimately, let's remember, we're not gonna have a nationwide ban. So your worst case scenario might mean that you have gotta transfer your embryos to another state. Now, somebody who's a practicing fertility doctor in a state like this, I don't love that answer. I am hopeful that we, as a community, can speak about how this can impact us. And we need to pay really close attention to the language that's going into bills. People need IVF. Nobody wants to do IVF, but people lean on IVF to build their families. Anybody who's ever gone through it, it doesn't discriminate, meaning you can feel personally a lot of different ways and still end up in the position where you might need IVF to conceive. You may choose that that's not the right choice for you, and that's your right. But if you need IVF and you want to pursue it with me, I want you to have the highest efficiency. I want you to get the best return on that investment. It's expensive. I want you to get pregnant the fastest. I want you to be the safest. I want you to have the highest chance of having the family you want. And when laws come in place that limit our ability to utilize this technology in a safe fashion, we are suddenly going to be limiting the number of people that can have a family. And how is that in line with what anybody wants? The reality is that we have seen this coming. We've been talking about this for over a year. However, now it's really going to be here. And if we don't utilize our voice, we're gonna turn back the clock 50 years. Besides the fact that one out of four women get abortion, and you know somebody who's gotten an abortion, and besides the fact that this is not going to limit abortions, but it will limit safe abortions, and more people will die because of this, it also is going to impact 
an already vulnerable and stigmatized population, and those are my infertility patients. People who come to me to have a family. I want to be able to practice medicine in the best way possible. Already, I am talking through these issues with every patient. I want to understand their comfort level. If they have hesitations because of their own personal beliefs, they deserve the right to have that conversation. However, if your goal is to have a large family, you also should not be forced to have your family size limited. You also should not be forced to have a child with a genetic disease. You should not be forced to pass on a cancer gene throughout your lineage. You should not be forced to be unable to freeze your eggs or embryos if you are undergoing a cancer diagnosis. And overturning Roe versus Wade is going to take away the umbrella of protection that we have in the fertility field to try to help our patients get pregnant. I implore you to do something. Use your voice, talk on your social media, share your story, share other stories. Donate to organizations like Planned Parenthood, ACLU. Also look at your local elections and vote. Your vote is important. If we've learned anything, being stagnant and not interested in politics is an extremely immature and harmful decision. You need to care about politics. You need to care about your country. You do not have to agree with everybody on every issue. You're entitled to your own religious and ethical beliefs, and that is supposed to be the beauty of this country. I want you to use your vote. Look at your local elections. Look at your national elections. Understand the issues that matter. And please, 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 when all of your physicians, all your OBGYNs and your fertility doctors feel the same very strong way about an issue, we implore you to listen. ASRM is the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and they have released a statement as well. Moreover, while the immediate target of these restrictions is abortion care, there is clear and present danger that measures designed to restrict abortion could also end up curtailing access to the family building treatments upon which our infertility patients rely on to build their families. In other words, not only does this draft decision threaten the health of pregnant people, it may also lead to fewer healthy babies being born to loving parents. So your doctors are speaking. You know somebody who's gone through IVF. You know people who need infertility treatments. And please do not limit their ability to have families. This is bigger than just abortion. This is all of our reproductive rights together. Thank you, friends. As always, you can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, or you can check out more on the As Woman podcast. 